Thank you to the library. Yay! Thank you to Star. Yay! Thank you to Emeritus Soundman Mitch. Yay! And, and to the Helicon Committee also. Yay! So uh, as far as introductions go, we're going to go through this really quick. This is Russ Beck right here. Uh, Russ Beck is a lecturer in the English Department of USU. Very well known, very well liked. Right? I mean, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Love. 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 Yeah. He's a writer for the Huffington Post, and he is the co-author of On Fly Fishing, The Northern Rockies, Essays and Dubious Advice. Uh, my name is Chad Van Zandt. I'm an environmental editor uh, here in the Valley. I'm also a writer of Outdoor Tales. I am the other co-author of On Fly Fishing, The Northern Rockies, Essays and Dubious Advice. And I am the author of this book, which is called On Fly Fishing, The Wind River Range, uh, Essays and a List of Whatnot to Bring. That's kind of what we're launching this in London. It came out a while ago, uh, but we're finally uh, launching it in, on our home turf. We've got the band together to do a little uh, demonstration of fly tying and, and fish lit. Uh, but most importantly, with those introductions in place, we have over <coughs> on my right, Tim King, who is a... Tim King is a retired rocket scientist. I'm not kidding even at all. <laughs> Recently retired, you can clap for that. Yeah. Yeah. Living, living the dream, and uh, he's kind of the John Bonham to our Led Zeppelin, uh, and we couldn't do this without him and without this massive TV. Yeah. Uh, so we're glad to have uh, Tim King. He is, most importantly for our purposes this evening, he is a professional tire of flies, <coughs> Rainey's Premium Flies, a uh, sort of fly tire to the world, yeah. a concern that actually started here in Logan uh, long ago. Uh, so with those introductions out of the way, I'm going to try to just walk you through what's going to happen tonight. This is for those of you who have never been to a Hooks and Books, but it's also for those of you who have been to a Hooks and Books, but it just didn't make any sense at all. We get that, we're happy for another chance to clarify. So this is what we call interpretive fly tying. Russ and I are going to read stories of the outdoors and, and, fly, and fly fishing, and our words and expressions and idioms and, and our, our narratives are going to be captured, interpreted, if you will, in the thread and the fur and the feathers <coughs> of an exquisitely crafted fly, uh, fly fishing fly. And you'll be able to watch Tim King's work here on this, on this monitor. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that this is just a gimmick that we came up with to kind of pad out our, our readings. <laughs> I'm going to just tell you right now, it is not just that. <laughs> It is an art form that we developed, the three of us, we are, the, we are the inventors of it and the sole practitioners of it. And if you think it's easy to come up with an entirely new art form and foist it onto the art world, you should think again, because we've been at this for three years yeah. and we haven't had even one invitation to like the Kennedy Center. <laughs> so we're going to keep on doing this. And when there is, when, when we prevail and there is, a fly tying demonstration, a performance of interpretive fly tying on every other street corner up and down Logan. <laughs> Think but, buskers. Yeah. yeah. You guys will be able to say, and, and you will join a very elite group of art lovers, you will be able to say, we were there when they started doing that interpretive fly tying. When they, when, at the founding of this art form, we were there. And you'll be able to join an even smaller group of people by saying, and that's where I bought my book. I bought a book from those guys. A very small circle of art appreciators. So, uh, any questions? That's what we're going to be doing tonight. This is Hooks and Books, and we really appreciate you coming. Um, we have performed for empty rooms. We, we will do it, but we because we enjoy it just that much. But we like having people, and I think you're going to have fun tonight. This is the way it's going to go. I'm going to read uh, something from the new book. Uh, while Tim ties a fly, Russ Beck is going to read an essay that he's been working on. And then I'll finish you out with a part of another essay from, from the Wind Rivers book. Tim, uh, we're ready to rock and roll. Okay, first, I'd just like everybody to just sit back and take a deep breath. Chad kind of hits you like a tornado sometimes. <laughs> and in order to get into the, the right head for this, um, just drop it down a notch or two. Okay. And uh, I think he's a little stressed out because we had trouble with the TV. And he just feels like we're eating up your valuable time, which we are. 
but uh, I can't think of a better way to waste it than watching us. So, yeah, um, yeah so it's all good now. We're okay. out of control. All right. Um, and you're going to be reading which? I, I'm going to be reading from a, a chapter in the book called When We Were Lost. I'm going to start this <coughs> off on a kind of a somber note. Um, this is a, a chapter in the book that uh, covers a, a time that I went to Wind Rivers with a friend of mine, Jason. And we went to a site, we went to a canyon that I'd only been to once before. And um, it had been, you know, a year or so since I'd been there. And uh, we got up there and I went down a wrong fork of the trail. This is on the, on the eastern side of the Wind Rivers where there's not a lot of signage and there's lots of un, uh, 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 volunteer trails, I guess. We went down the wrong trail, we got lost, and I was writing about that, and I decided to also write about other mishaps and missing persons that happened in the Wind Rivers, fatalities, people who got lost but got found, and uh, so I'm just going to read you a part of that, just by way of setup. Um, it was really cold that year, and uh, there was no deadfall on the ground to collect for firewood. So if you've ever been in the mountains, you've seen these, you know, a tree will fall over in the mountains, and then it'll rot away and it'll leave the gray roots kind of sticking up and a little bit of the, 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 the trunk. And it, they, they look to me like dragon skulls, dinosaur skulls. So when I refer to that, that was the only thing we could find that burns. We pulled this big stump over, we we're burning it. It looked like, a, looked like the head of a dragon. So just when we get to that part, that'll make sense for you. And so what are we tying to go along with that? So yeah, the, the idea, as Chad mentioned, um, I tie a fly to complement the reading he's doing. Just like hand and glove, it fits perfect. Just, just, just like that. Yeah. And not only that, but I finished the fly, the, my last wrap and maybe a drop of head cement, as Chad is saying, and that's the end. So we, we bring it all together to, to happen at once. Right. And the, in the three years and 20 sometimes we've performed this, our I think this happened twice. <laughs> that we finished at the same time. Yeah, we, um, we want that now. So I was going to try to time the readings, but I'm not going to be able to keep refreshing my phone, so we're going to wing it again. But anyway, the point is, I tie a, a fly to complement his story. Now, this story that he's reading tonight is a new one from his latest book that we haven't done before, and it doesn't mention fishing. <coughs> that I remember. There's not a lot of fishing in this and, one. And there were, I had no idea what fly is going to complement a story about not fishing. So <laughs> I said, screw it, I'm going to tie a fancy one that I like to tie and uh, leave it at that. All right. So, <coughs> okay, well this is, uh, this, this is from the chapter in the book called uh, When We Were Lost. Uh, and like I said, there's a series of anecdotes about missing persons and mishaps in the in the, in the Wind River, so I'm just starting right in the middle of it. And one more thing, if, mm. if for some reason the vice moves and you, you lose the image, no, we just did. let me know. We lost the image. Did the TV go off or did the camera go off? I think the camera went off. Or is it a screensaver? Um, this is your camera. You might have to come out wake it up. Just uh, uh, hit the... It's on film roll index? No. There you go. If that does it again, hit the start button. Yeah. So hard. Yeah, hard. <laughs> <laughs> Not hard enough to just clean up at the ceiling. <laughs> Off to a bad start. <laughs> Can we go up from here, Chad? Okay. <laughs> this is uh, when we were lost. Perhaps the most famous missing person case of the Wind Rivers, a now legendary tale of faith and survival, is that of Mike Turner, a tall, burly Presbyterian pastor and outdoorsman from Caldwell, Idaho. Mike was 48 in July of 1998 when he planned a wander in wonder, a 10-day sojourn with his black lab, Andy, through the Wind Rivers, across the Continental Divide, and into the big sandy drainage to meet his family. In a journal of the trip, he wrote, I had dreamed of a special time alone with God, facing the elements, the passes, thinking about my life, the direction of the church, about my family. By the end of his trip, Mike confessed that he had gotten what he came for multiplied by 100. Others might argue that the factor was closer to 1,000. He set out on July 30th, writing his impressions of what he saw as God's majesty. So quiet, so perfect. Is it all as you want it, God? 
In beauty and peace you refresh me. God bless this trip. May it fulfill your holy purposes. Soon the going was harder. There was snow in the passes and glacial crevasses to negotiate. Andy was foot sore from the coarse ice, so Mike changed his route. Mike himself even lost traction and toboggan down an incline on Knife Point Glacier. What a tough time, he wrote. On August 2nd, day four, Mike was traversing a boulder field near a lake at 11,400 11, feet in the Brown Cliffs area of the, Fitz, the Fitzpatrick Wilderness. Boulder fields are common in Alpine wilderness, artifacts of the, of the Ice Age. Stones ranging from suitcase size to that of minivans were scooped up and scraped along by glaciers. The receding ice left behind the boulder fields, some acres in size. To cross them on foot, you hop from one boulder to the next, a test of route finding skills and knee joint condition. Young, hi young hikers enjoy it. Most of, the, most of us of advanced years dread it. I imagine Mike took it in stride, taking photos and basking in the solitude, but because the boulders are arranged just as gravity left them 10 millennia ago, they might balance delicately atop one another for thousands of years, waiting only the tread of a hiker to tilt or topple, which can result in a bone-shattering fall or much worse, and that is what happened to Mike. <clears throat> the massive stone he stepped on rolled underfoot. He managed to jump off it, but he landed on another boulder that was too steeply pitched for traction, and he slid down. Also sliding down was the boulder he dislodged, which weighed 800 pounds. When Mike and the boulder met, his legs were pinned. Mike lay on a boulder at a steep angle, almost in a seated position, his feet dangling over its edge with a fridge-sized rock pressing firmly against his thighs. Incredibly, he wasn't injured. He wasn't seriously injured in that moment. His right leg was crossed over his left, but the boulder did not crush his legs or even break the skin. It pressed against him just snugly enough to keep him trapped as one reporter put it, like a pair of giant shackles. Mike spent hours trying to escape. He wriggled and pulled against the pressure. He levered the stone with his camera tripod. But from his ungainly position, there was no way to budge the boulder. Daytime temperatures ro rose to around 100 degrees, and at night it was nearly freezing. Mike spread his tent awkwardly overhead for shade and wrapped himself in his sleeping bag at night, but pinned the way he was in the open at high elevation, legs pinched and exposed, Actual shelter and warmth were mere notions. The, journals, the journal entries show Mike alternating between anger and, humili and humility. God is with me, but I am angry, he lamented. At other times, Mike was circumspect, especially for someone trapped, in, in, trapped for days in such a plight. So lonely, he wrote, more than I imagined. Who would have guessed that four days would have gone by and no one has come this way? When his water <coughs> ran out and he melted all the snow within reach, Mike tied a cord around his water bottle and lobbed it at the lake, which was only 30 feet away, but the bottle snagged up in the rocks. He pondered what his urine might taste like with crystal light powder mixed in. Still, Mike remained focused on his God and family. As he grew weaker, he wrote, he wrote to them and of them. If I make it, Mike wrote, you will hear a lot about this time, details you are probably not that interested in, but I know you will listen. In another more ardent entry, I will trust God, though he will slay me. Down at Big Sandy, Mike's family waited. He'd said he'd meet them on noon, at noon on August 8th, and when he didn't appear, his wife Diane first thought he was only taking his time. Honestly, I just felt irritated, Diane told the reporter. I figured he was just out there taking pictures. Mike was reported missing late on Sunday, August 9th, but, that, but by that time, he'd been trapped beneath his boulder for a week, and he was beginning to accept his fate. Fill me with peace, Lord, he wrote. I am ready to die. Sometime after day five, Mike fumbled the journal and it slid out of reach. To continue his record, he wrote on the blank pages of his pocket-sized New Testament and in the margins of his cook stove instructions, but his body and mind were failing. Reports say many of Mike's later entries are cryptic and, in and in illegible. Shutting down, getting low, thought I would be found yesterday. Later, Mike wrote of seeing Diane and others nearby. Another entry is just the number three with a circle around it. Mike's family and congregation mobilized in force, posting flyers and phoning visitors who'd signed the National Park Service registries at the trailhead. Outdoor retailer REI circulated images of Mike's a solo boot tread pattern to aid search parties. However, on August, on August 23rd, after two weeks, the search for Mike was halted. The sheriff's office said they'd resume searching if there was a break in the case, and on August 28th there was, Andy the lab was found. 
The poor dog was malnourished and exhausted, but it was hoped he might lead searchers to Mike. Sadly, just as they got underway, a hiker from San Diego presented Mike's wallet, Mike's wallet to the Sheriff's Department in Pinedale. He'd spotted Mike's body in the boulder field on August 31st. I'd seen some posters at the trailhead, and I knew they were looking for someone, the hiker told a reporter. So I called out, hey, are you all right? There was no answer. He knew there wouldn't be. The coroner's report says Mike staved off thirst and the elements for an unthinkable nine days and died on August 11th the day the first search chopper lifted off. And uh, then there's, we kind of switch back to this perspective of me apologizing to my buddy for getting us lost out there. You don't hike down a trail, blink your eyes, and suddenly you're lost. It's a process. You get lost because one tree looks much like another and one hillside looks a lot like the last. You mistake the wrong place for the right and turn the wrong way, and then you make it worse by turning wrong again. Jason kept asking me, dude, are you sure we're not are you sure we're supposed to be this far south? Yeah, we're good, I said, barely looking up at the trail. We're going right. We're not too far south. We were way too far south. But it wasn't until late afternoon that I finally admitted it. Okay, I said, stopping on the trail at last. I think we do need to turn back. This doesn't look right anymore. Jason didn't pause to confer or confirm. He knew. He turned about on one foot and was headed back up the trail practically before I was through saying it. We backtracked three miles to the fork in the trail where I'd left, where I'd gone left instead of right. The problem was there wasn't much of a fork. It wasn't as if the two trails branched off at right angles, one leading due east to our campsite and the other forking south to some shadowy land of the lost. Instead, the path split by only about 12 degrees at first, as single tracks often do, only to join up again later. These two trails actually remained within view of each other, practically parallel for 100 yards or more. I laughed a little as I stepped onto the right fork, but it wasn't funny at all. The essence of getting lost lies within the narrow margins for error, errors that don't feel like errors, errors that compound. Jason and I were off route for only a few hours, but even a casual search of Pinedale Online, uh, that's their newspaper, their online newspaper, a casual search of Pinedale Online proves that that's how it always starts. One false step, sunset, and a few days later, somebody is reporting your physical description and last known whereabouts to the Sublet County Sheriff's Department while you're deliriously <coughs> crawling the number three in the back of a miniature Bible. It's as if the wilderness waits for you to make a mistake, and one wrong turn is all it will ever need to claim you. It's easy to fall in love with nature, but it will never love you back. You can never trust a mountain. You can't make friends with night. The flaming dragon skull grinned at us from the fire pit, its black and ruby scales pulsing hotly from the tireless gust of the cold front. Tiny embers flew back from its face and spines, creating the illusion that it was racing forward into the darkness. We sat drinking the whiskey. We sat drinking to it. We sat drinking the whiskey to it like sullen cultists. I can't believe I got us lost, I said. I drank and passed the flask back. Yeah, said Jason, that was fucked up. It's totally my fault, I said. Yeah, I know. He drank and held out the flask. Kill it off. A famous author long past once wrote, not all those who wander are lost. It's just one line from a poem in a grander saga, a gorgeous line, quite fitting for the character uh, it was written for. And because of its pithy element, elegance and penetrating truth, it has been co-opted as a personal motto for many, for many pressed into service for tattoos and t-shirt graphics, it's easy, easy to apply to ourselves, perhaps because it makes us seem more mysterious and adventurous than we really are. But implicit in those evocative staves is a more trenchant and universal truth. While not all those who wander are lost, most of us certainly are. <laughs> I lifted the flask to my lips and drained it. The dragon skull smoldered all night. How do you do? Close enough. What is it? I think you didn't uh, mention the, the pattern. Oh, it's it's a, uh, a feather wing string <coughs> I've been tying lately that uh, imitates a small bait fish. Um, what's the what's the flashy feather on the side? What is that? The flash. The oh, pheasant. What is that? I don't know. The, the eye. Yeah. That's jungle cock. I, I didn't bring the skin. Nice. It. It's uh, actually a small one. Yeah. It's it's too too small feather from a. a <laughs> Chicken, pretty much. Uh, that's <laughs> European chicken. A a chicken that that was in danger and then and then like forbidden to 
to get feathers from, but now they're cultivating domestically. That's <coughs> correct, yes. Everything's okay. legal here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. Uh, we're going to have Russ back up now to read uh, from his essay. And in the meantime, there's actually a spot of my blood on the back where I just poked nice. myself. But, but I'll pass this around if you want to take a closer look. Good, cool. Um, I love tin slides. Like, I don't know. You know how, like, people who like fashion can. And I, this is not a good metaphor. <laughs> I'm just gonna back out of that one. Yeah. Totally off the cuff. Here. No, it, it looks it looks real good. We have good work on that. Um, I'm gonna read an essay that I. Uh, it's called, so we wrote a book called On Fly Fishing the Northern Rockies, and I wrote an essay called On Not Fly Fishing the Northern Rockies, and that's what I'm going to read tonight. Uh, and actually, I thought this was newish, but it's not. It's like two years old now, and it's not even done yet. I feel like I'm going to be I need to write something. Like that. But, uh, um, so yeah, it's about not fly fishing, and uh, what I should have done. The toll it takes on you. Yes, actually, yeah. So yeah, this morning, I woke up really grumpy, and I was like, I'm going to go fish. I'm going to go do it. And then I went and fished for 20 minutes, and I broke my rod. So it's a great day. So, uh, <laughs> I, I'm no, no pity. I'm, I'm fine. OK. Uh, so Tim, tell us what you're going to type for this one. Well, I just tied a fly for a story that had absolutely no fishing in it. So uh, now I'm going to tie a fly for a story that talks about not fishing. Uh, these Folks are going to start wondering what our real yeah, yeah exactly. is here. So uh, mine at least mentions that fishing is a thing. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah. So and and so when I learned the, the way this works, I, ahead of time I find out what stories they're going to be reading, and then I contemplate for weeks on end what fly I will tie to match <laughs> their stories. And so after I heard Russ was tying this or reading this story, I said, Well, I'm going to tie a fly that I like to tie. You know, the heck with trying to match something. Good, I like it. And then the story behind this one, we, we did this presentation at the King's English uh, a couple times, but I think the first time we were down there, <coughs> this fly incorporates deer hair, and, and you'll, you'll understand when we get to that point. But when you're tying on deer hair, which is hollow, and you pull it tight, it has a tendency to flare out. And the fellow, <coughs> the owner of the, the King's English was behind my shoulder as I was doing this is we were reading a story and when I pulled this thread out and the hair flared I heard this audible <gasps> behind me <laughs> and so I did it again and I listened I went and he went <gasps> <laughs> and so that's a cue some of you know where to come in but to help the rest of the world. I'm glad the audience is going to be participating yes yeah, well, so. maybe they will no, if, no, if no. they're still waiting so I uh, so anyway that's the floor yeah. <coughs> Okay, good. Uh, all right, so this is called uh, Not Fly Fishing the Northern Rockies. This past summer, I can count on two hands how many times I fished. I went from fishing at least twice a week, sometimes as many as four times a week, to fishing a few times a month. There was always something that kept me from the river, a house project, time spent with my daughter, visiting my parents, travel, work, always something that, always something, and that something always seemed legitimate. What kept me from the river more than anything this year was my wife, <coughs> some friends, and I bought a cabin together. I'm writing this from the cabin's kitchen table, uh, right on the frozen, uh, sorry, on the kitchen table, uh, on a frozen November morning. I can see smoke from my fireplace billowing out over the black willows that stretch towards the Logan River. If I open a window, which I won't, it's far too cold and the windows stick, I can hear the river rushing past rocks. It's only 20 feet away. What I can hear instead is the start of a whistle from a, the teapot on the cast iron stove. And with some music, I can hear the pops and hisses from my record player. Of course, the irony of the cabin is that I bought it to have a closer connection to the river. I wanted that tangible and physical, physical connection to that river where I learned to fish. My ideal morning was waking up before my wife and kid, soaking a fire to keep them warm, slipping on my waders and then slipping into the river for a few hours. I wouldn't go far enough away that I couldn't smell the cabin <coughs> stove fire. The fish would always be okay, not great. She and my daughter would come out to watch me fish the last hole before exiting the river dripping. 
my wife would hand me a cup of coffee that smelled like it had a little whiskey in it, and I'd warm my hands on the hand-thrown ceramic mug. She'd make uh, some quip about not getting used to being served on, and I'd smile. That perfect morning has happened exactly zero times. <laughs> Many, philosophers, uh, many philosophies and religions around the world have attempted to tackle the problems with ownership. Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. Buddhism talks about how possessions actually start to own you. The problem I see with ownership is you have to believe that something can be owned. So you have to think less of that thing. You can't own a sunset or the Grand Canyon. While Stegner, just a second. No, I'm good. Sorry, I panicked there for a second. I'm okay. How are you doing, Tim? Have you, have you flared out yet? Or? I don't even want to. No, I haven't flared out. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. You can't own a sunset or the Grand Canyon. Wallace Stegner said, National parks are the best idea we ever had. Absolutely American, absolutely democratic. They reflect us at our best rather than our worst. Stegner is, of course, right. For me, the most important word in that quote is democratic. By spreading out the land ownership, making it so everyone and no one owned the land, it made it so citizens could truly, uh, truly and simply enjoy what the land offered. They didn't have to depend on it to yield support or to uh, secure it because it belonged to everyone. I now own a sliver of the national forest, that, that thing that was meant to be unownable. Actually, according to the forest, I own the right to own a cabin on public land. Their contract is convoluted and confusing but here's the facts. There's a road up Logan Canyon that has a gate on it that I know the combination to that I'm not supposed to tell anybody about. Every time I dial in that last digit on the combination, I feel a fleeting tinge of guilt. I'm ruining the democratic nature of public land. I want to be noble and say that that guilt is what has kept me out of the river, but it's not that. It's the obligation of the ownership instead. This summer, I also started swimming. The idea was that I would build up some endurance so that I could go on uh, long fishing trips with my buddies that required a hike in and out. Uh, how do I put this? I'm the guy who always rides in the front of the boat and usually shotgun in the car. Not because everyone is nice to me, they are, but because that's the only place that makes sense for me to ride. I'm a large guy, and although I'm fairly active and agile for my size, I'm still usually the last one up the hill, regardless of the hill. The swimming started slowly. At first, it, it was to entertain my daughter. She'd straddle my back, and I'd uh, make laps around the pool while she pretended I was a reindeer. Or we'd look for space junk on the bottom of the pool, or whatever the game is that she made up that day. Then I started going without her. When I used the outdoor pool, I'd see uh, spent, confused mayflies atop the pool, their bodies and wings chlorine bleached bone white. Now I swim three to four times a week. I haven't lost much weight, but I feel looser and I have more energy. By all accounts, the swimming is working. But I didn't go on any backpacking trips, uh, fly, backpacking fly fishing trips. Oh, no. <laughs> that was excellent. <laughs> in a way, swimming has uh, provided me the release that fishing once did. I think it's no coincidence that how often I swim mirrors how often I once fished. And because it requires less of everything, planning, time, and money, I end up doing it far more often than sometimes in place of fishing. Both of these things, the cabin and swimming, I did to fish more, but both have made me fish less. I know now that time spent away from fishing, even if it's in service of fishing, is still time spent not fishing. Oh. <laughs> that is so misleading because I thought it was my great. <laughs> No, no, I, I, I'm so okay with it. Too. Uh, it's, your book. it's your story, right? No, no, it's all your story. Right. It's all about you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let me get back. Okay, every serious angler I know is trying to find a way to be more connected to the river. They're trying to find a way to make it so their waders never fully dry. But the secret to fishing more might just be that: to fish more, to sacrifice other things to be on the water more often. We don't need to own more things or do more things to fish more. We only need to fish more. Until I really figure it out, you'll probably find me loading my gym bag into my car or painting my cabin instead of actually finishing. <laughs> <laughs> and in a way, that's fine. I get something out of the cabin and swimming. I do, but I don't get everything. I still miss so many things about fishing consistently. I miss the way the browns smell <coughs> different than rainbows. 
I miss uh, rock rolling caddis larvae and the drake hatches. The thing I miss most about consistently fishing is the way stress caused by things like cabin ownership and swimming schedules have a way to slip out of me and into the river as I fish. Oh. Oh man, I went way too fast, didn't I? Yeah, you did. Why don't you start over again? <laughs> this time we'll offer you. Uh, no. uh, so we can. Tim, why don't you narrate? What are you doing? Okay, I'm uh, spinning deer hair. Thank you for the uh, vocal support. Um, like I said, the hair is hollow, and uh, when you apply thread tension onto the fibers, it collapses and to puff out. It's, it's hollow because this is how deer stay warm in the winter. Um, I knew that that's what it did, but I didn't know why that's what it did. That's cool. Why what did? Like, <laughs> I knew that, I, I mean, I, I spun this guy's deer. A writer, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I know that. Uh, I've spun deer air before, but I didn't know that yeah. it's because it was hollow. Because it's, it's got uh, compartments, air, air huh. pockets. And uh, now, this is another, in, in some classes that I've taught, uh, we introduced the double-edged razor, which if you're a guy of a certain vintage, you know double-edged razors are a hell of a lot sharper than single-edged razor blades. It's the perfect tool for trimming hair. And uh, you can get lost in this procedure carving and carving and carving until you've carved off too much hair and then you end up with a it looks like a little cigarette butt. But, um, so I'm going to do a real fast cursory carve here because you didn't come to watch me, you came to listen to these curves. Uh, yeah, we're never sure about that. <laughs> but, but the nice thing about this fly in relation to the readings, I can, I can do this as the reader is, is slowly finishing his story. <laughs> and when he's done, I can say, oh, I'm done. So this, this uh, process of using deer hair to kind of make a solid body is, is uh, necessary because uh, you can't make it out of like wood or metal as you would in a spinning uh, lure. Uh, the, in a spinning lure, the, the lure is the heavy thing that pulls the, the line out of the reel and into the water. In fly fishing, the line is heavier than the than the lures, and so they have to be very, very light. And uh, and this is, you know, even though it's bulky and it has a lot of body to it, it's still going to be <coughs> just almost weightless. Less than my own flight. Yeah. So I'm going to call that good. And now I have an excuse for having a hacked up job because I was rushed. And <laughs> now I'll take. The These, uh, these flies are meant to go home with somebody, so if you're a, a fly angler, if you have interest in fly tying or something, um, just talk to Tim and he'll, he'll uh, Or if they don't show back up on my table, I'll assume right. they went to good home. <laughs> just let everybody see them for So um, I just want to read uh, one more piece. Uh, it's, this is the first chapter of the book, and the purpose of it is to sort of set the stage for what's, what you might expect for going into the wind rivers or, or sort of what I, you know, what I view them as. And um, because it's on fly fishing, the, the wind river range, it has a lot to do with fly fishing. Basically just um, uh, sort of outlining how fabulous the fishing is there. And uh, it's just a series of uh, small uh, stories about uh, just crazy things that, uh, that happen, crazy fishing things. Crazy in fishing terms, they might not strike you as, as particularly <laughs> outrageous, but um, it's not like deer hair flaring, or it's not going to be anything. Like that. <laughs> but you could still do an R. He feels so moved during his reading. Yeah, yeah. If you, if you yeah, do it to him. It's weird. So <laughs> it's like, you're like gasping. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, so, um, but thank you for coming, and there's going to be an uh, uh, open mic afterwards. So I'm excited to hear your poems and your and your readings. Um, thanks again to. Russ and uh, Tim for helping helping out with this book. I have a few copies of this book. There's many fly anglers. I, what I, I didn't bring very many because I figured if you if you haven't bought a copy by now, you don't want it. So <laughs> if you are interested in backpacking and fly angling, I have a couple copies. Um, 
uh, uh, Tim came up with our pricing structure. Uh, the sticker price is $22. If you have a sign, it's $20. So. <laughs> 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 kind of deal. so this is called No Caution in Them. Tim, what are we, uh, we going to um, use this, for this one? This is a story from Chad's new book, like he said, the latest book. <coughs> and uh, it uh, involves a fly pattern known as the Fat Albert. And if you're a fly fisherman, you know a fat albert is a is this ungodly foam uh, construct that uh, utilizes absolutely no natural material whatsoever. And, and I don't have a I like to tie with natural materials. Obviously, I've tied with some synthetic plastics and whatnot tonight. But this fat albert is just foam, foam, and rubber legs and more foam. And and uh, with these. We've done this story twice, I think, and both times I tied a foam fat hour, and I just didn't feel good about it. And it was an easy fly that I would finish way in advance and just sit here with my ugly foam fly yeah. sitting in front of me. So, and since the other two flies had nothing to do with the reading, I thought, I just want to tie a nice, fancy soft tackle fly that I like to tie. <laughs> because it, I think it's, it, you're going to get more out of this fly than you would a little foam cigarette butt. Yeah. So, not to, but you didn't come for me. You came to listen to chat, so it doesn't matter what I did. So I'm not <laughs> Why did you say that? I, I'm, right. I'm looking out here. I can see what people are watching. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can hear you with their ears. It's a multi-sensory experience. I'm just, I'm just letting you know. Take your time. Take your time on this one. Okay. Add in all, and, and the, all so, the extra features. Because of the, what I'm tying, it does take a little more time. So we can wallow and chat story together as I this one's a little more upbeat. accomplish this fly. <laughs> yes. Rather than the foam thing that is just a piece of foam. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is no caution in them. It's just before 5 o'clock in the morning. It's early August at Big Sandy Lake in the Wind River Range of Wyoming. For an hour, I've lain awake and patiently waiting as the tent fly displays the first rays of day. In the half light, I sit up and get dressed, head bumping on the roof of the tent. I unpackage myself from the tent like some great insect birthing from an, in, an egg sack. And then I sit in the frosted get, grass, yawning, my breath smoking. Everyone else in camp is still asleep. The sun has not risen, but it lights the mountaintops on the west side of the valley. Everything is new to me. It's all very interesting. Every glade, every waterfall, the backcountry spruce and pines growing in copses that might have been arranged and groomed by some seasoned but sentimental gardener. Even the ground is a source of fascination to me, with its mosaic of miniature succulents, orange and purple lichen scales, jubilant forbs, and the salt and pepper speckled pebbles that crunch when stepped upon. And the Wind River peaks loom over all, inscrutable green <coughs> gods whose moods shift as sun and clouds pass over. Then there is the lake, lying in the floor of the valley, its misty surface a mirror to reflect the shades of imperceptibly gathering light. And it is, of course, the schools of fish in the lake that really bring me here. It's them I've come to see about. The mountains are astounding, without doubt, and the hillside thickets are darkly remarkable, too. But I have come in search of water, and I have come in search of trout. My waders are stiff with cold. I push my feet down into the neoprene socks and pull them, up as I stand, pull them on as I stand up. My fly rod is already rigged and leaning against the branch of a bristle cone. I hastily eat a little bit, bit of breakfast and then leave the camp. Not long after I reach the lake, a few fish begin to rise. And as the sun comes up, their feeding grows so fan frantic, the lake dimples as though by hailstones. Such exhibits of widespread single-minded animal behavior are always affecting, but this is more rising fish than I've ever seen. I tie on a mosquito pattern in size 18, and the trout slam practically every cast. They cast, they, they strike whether the fish, the fly fo floats or sinks, they strike it, while it trails in the water as I wade. They hit so hard they miss three times out of five. Still, I catch fish after fish. Soon the fly is sodden and slimy, beginning to unravel. And after I unhook the 11th or 12th fish, it's just a few wraps of thread on an otherwise bare hook. My first trip to the Wind Rivers has begun. It's nearing lunchtime, the final day of a longer trip. We've been fishing in the rain at a stream near our camp. Our jacket hoods are up and hats pulled low, but then the sun comes out, so I lie in the grass by the bank to eat my lunch. Propped up on one elbow, I peek sleepily between the reeds and see fish feeding in the creek. 
They contend for position and take turns gulping the mayflies that glide down the drift like tiny sailing ships. Dave's son, Braden, joins me and watches the fish a while. He's maybe 13, a quiet kid. His fly, my fly rod is leaning on a rock behind me. And Braden asks if he can try it. Oh, you fly fish? I ask. I have a few times, he says. Not, I'm not very good yet. Yeah, it's tricky. Well, yeah, go ahead. Try that rod. He picks up the rod and unhooks the fly from the keeper. Then he goes to the grassy bank and waggles the rod back and forth over his shoulder. The line flounces in the air, doubling back and whip cracking. Lower your elbow, I say, without getting up. And keep your wrist stiff. He doesn't understand, but I don't want to get off my ass to demonstrate. Eventually, he slings the line in the vicinity of the stream, like a, like a burst of silly stream. It lands in a heap on the water, practically at his feet, and then floats downstream, <coughs> dragging and snagging. And despite his best efforts, Braden catches a fish. It crashes up into the fly and pinwheels glittering over the water before splashing down again. I got one, says Braden over his shoulder. It's unclear if he's pleased about it or not. Yeah, I say, good job. I assume Braden will set the hook at some point that day, but there's 10 feet of slack line on the water between the fly and the top fly guide, so it's probably not going to matter. You've got to set that hook, I tell him, <coughs> with a mouthful of trail mix. i got to do what now? Pull back, I say, on the rod, lift the rod tip. It's too late. The fish has shaken the hook, but another one takes its place right away. I don't know if Braden even notices, but the replacement fish is kind enough to set the hook himself, and then he struggles in sort of a, in, then he, I'm sorry, and then it begins a one-sided struggle, like a dancer who commandeers the lead from a partner who doesn't know the steps. You always have to set the hook in the fish's mouth, I explain. I pantomime a hook sticking me in the cheek. Otherwise, I'll just spit it out. The line has drifted down and straightened in the current. The replacement fish jumps and tail walks, which strikes me as slightly show-offy, but it was nice of him to stay hooked. I can't think of another place where a kid who knows so little about fly fishing can catch two fish on his first cast. If it worked that way back in the real world, every single person on earth would own a fly rod and waders. Braden lifts the rod tip, finally. It flexes with the weight of the fish and the current. He reels in and meets the fish at the bank. It's a 13-inch rainbow, respectable for that stream. He unhooks the fish and lets it go. Then he rests my rod on the rock and walks away, apparently under the impression that while fly fishing may be an easy way to catch fish, it's too complicated to be very much fun. <coughs> it's mid-August. Mid it's midday, mid-August, mid-stream. It's warm with only a few clouds moving through, and I've skipped lunch with the others to fish by myself. Fly choice isn't important today. The fish are taking dries over fast water, so I launch a big stimulator and the fly sinks in the jostle. But I see the bright yellow hackle below the surface, and there comes the flicker of a striking fish. I set the hook and strip in a two-pound cut bow. I lead him to the net, but I don't lift him from the water. The fly falls out of his lip, and he swims against the, the side of the net. He's got a battered, oversized tail fin, probably a favorite of the local spawning females. With his bright silvery flanks and fuchsia throat, he glints in the sun like a jeweled sword. For a moment, I debate whether or not to get a photo of him. In a few minutes, I'll really wish I had, but he's not even the nicest fish I've caught that day, let alone the trip. So I push the net down and out from under the fish, and he swims free. Then I wring the water from the stimulator by pinching it in a fold of my shirt sleeve, but the stimmy just won't float anymore. So I bite the fly <coughs> off, stick it in my hat, and stick it in my hat to dry. Then I open my fly box, but instead of grabbing a new stimulator, I wonder if there's something in there that these fish will not eat. I poke around and come up with a killer caddis, which is just five iridescent beads and a little crystal flash on a size eight, size eight nymph hook. No detail, no anatomy. My buddy Chip gave it to me while we were fishing for bluegill on Pelican Lake in the Uinta Basin. I shrug and tie it on. Nothing on the first cast, nothing on the second. And I frown a little. OK, I can see the killer caddis hasn't got much of a following up here. That's noted. But on the third cast, I feel a tug, and a minute, a minute or two later, I net a fish. I reach down to jiggle out the hook, but before I let the, the current flush him from the net, I do a double take. It's the big-tailed cut bow I just let go, the fish that bit the stimmy. It's around 2.30 in the afternoon. Jason and I are halfway through a five-day trip on the Indian Reservation, where you buy a trespass permit instead of a Wyoming fishing license. We're heading to a cirque and a deep lake where I fished the previous year. Jason has seen the photos of the fish I caught there, so even though I'm leading the way, I have to hurry to stay out front. Our fly rods waggle and flex <coughs> eagerly as we go. We pass by two other lakes on our left, 
and I see fish hunting in the shallows like German U-boats. They zigzag over the light-colored mud among the submerged rocks. Look, I say to Jason, pointing with my fly rod. Look at that big boy. It's a large cutthroat. From 30 yards, I can plainly see his crimson gill plate and animal-shaped head. He's heading toward the bank. Kind of far out there, says Jason. He's coming this way, though, I say. I'm equipped with my Tenkara rod, perfect for stealth casting over a, over a shrub to hook a fish near the shore or beneath an overhanging bank but its reach is only 30 feet. In my brain, a frantic calculus gets underway, estimating the cutthroat's rate of travel and approach angle to determine where on the bank I'll need to be when he comes close enough for me to reach him. I'm heading west on a game trail about 10 feet inland with the cutthroat on my left. The cutthroat is also westering with me on his right. As we converge, the chance of him spotting me goes up and up. He's gonna see you, dude, says Jason. He stops in the trail behind me to stay out of sight. Well, maybe if I pull ahead, or maybe if I slow down, he'll pull ahead of me. I motion to play with my hands. Maybe, says Jason. I don't know. He's getting away. Shit, he's like big. Yeah, says Jason. He's big. I know, I say. That the cutthroat is big makes the situation quite a bit worse than if he were small. I cannot, must not, lose this fish. To lose a fish like this to bad technique or other misstep would call for an unslightly blotch on my record. I go into a crouch and blunder through the chest-high shrubs tripping and scrambling to stay ahead of the, to stay with the cutthroat and line up a shot from behind. I lose sight of the fish. Where's he at? Still there, says Jason, by the rock, on the left. Uh, that one? Your other left. Don't let him get away. You see him? Yeah. Shit. <coughs> Shit. He's getting away, dude. The cutthroat nears the bank. And I, bark my, I bark my shin and stumble over a staff knuckle of alder trunk, maintaining just enough footing to press ahead with a kind of clawing, swimming motion. Jason stops kibitzing and watches bemused as I thrash for open ground so I can start casting. On my tippet is a size 10 fat Albert to imitate the grasshoppers that crackle through the air here like sparks of unharnessed electricity. They emerge on warm afternoons, advertising for sex by arcing up from the grass to snap and flash their red and yellow wings, a core of minuscule semaphore signalmen. The fat Albert is a lumpy and crude imitation, more suggestive of a stepped-on Tootsie Roll than a sleek alpine ornithopter. But it is also a durable artificial, constructed mainly of foam, and remains buoyant even after multiple maulings in the, tooths, in the toothy mouths of mature cutthroat. This cutthroat still doesn't seem me. God only knows what. This fish must be really distracted. Family problems, pressure at work. It's slightly unnerving. Because once he catches on, he'll vanish like he never even existed. For now, he's within 15 feet of the bank, and I'm shadowing him, but he's still pulling forward, and I need to gain another 12 feet on him if I want to cast far enough ahead of his nose for a clean, conspicuous take. I begin false casting furiously, groping for the zone between getting spotted and getting into range. I move in, and he turns around. <coughs> Something tiny on the water has caught the cutthroat's eye, and he turns slowly for a better look. It's a midge or spinner invisible to me. The cutthroat takes it. He doesn't swirl or jump for it, <coughs> but I clearly hear a wet poop as his beak breaks the surface and then closes for the eat. Now the cutthroat is heading directly at me. I freeze, limbs motionless in awkward attitudes. He swims past, and I keep still, not even blinking, a landlubber in a game of freeze tag with a water ghost. He's tall through the body, Slight kite to his underbite, dark bronze back, confident, predatory. He eats again from the surface, boop, and then angles off away from the shore in the direction he first came. All at once I'm behind him again, but I've only got one chance to cast before he's out of reach. A flurry of possibly relevant considerations occurs to me. Wind direction, what's in my back, back cast? If the yogurt in my fridge back home has maybe expired, I make one false cast and then lay the fly down, and it falls short. Fat Albert comes down slightly behind the cutthroat, but it comes down hard, it comes down like a cannonball. There's a splash, radiating rings. The fish detects the commotion, circles back, and opens his mouth to take the fly. Good old Fat Albert. I pull on the rod. My timing is perfect and will result in a very secure hook set, probably in the cutthroat's upper lip, where it's bony and tough. I'm already picturing how to play him. The hook catches, the line traces out of the water, the rod bends, and the fly comes free. There, there is a procession of poorly conjugated profanity. From me, probably. It's just the word shit repeated over and over again. <laughs> I stuck the fish. The hook stuck him. 
it's over. My eyes follow the fly in line sailing up from the water, and I know that when I lay the fly down again, it will only be a whirl of mud and an eddy in the shallows where the cutthroat had been. I make a sloppy back cast too low, it whip cracks and nearly snags the branches <coughs> on my back. But when I look down, the cutthroat is still there. I gawk. Too big to have been bothered by an inconsequential prick of a hook, the, the cutthroat has come about again and is wondering where his meal went. He's not hooked, he's not spooked, he's just annoyed. My cast shoots forward, and somehow I place the fly right back down on the disturbed water. It must seem to the fish as though Fat Albert never left the scene. The cutthroat opens wide, his pointed snout breaks the water, looms over the fly, and I rip it away from him. A sudden case of buck fever. Fat Albert rocks back through, rockets back through the water, and then the line and fly are airborne again. I catch a glimpse of a turning tail, fins flatten to the body as the cutthroat flees. But when flat, Fat Albert loops forward for his final cannonball, the cutthroat 180s around. He's a really patient fish. He's four feet from the fly, and now he's pissed. He pumps his tail for speed and hits Pat, Fat Albert like a train. <coughs> his jaws clamp on the fly, and he turns on it fiercely, raising a semicircle of a semicircular sheet of water with his tail fin. It's a beautiful take, a wild, violent take by a big, aggressive fish. When I play it back in my memory, it unfolds in slow motion. The fish bright, mouth parts radiant white, every droplet is like a, a shard of sunlight. I lift the rod, upper jaw for sure. The line zings taut like a telegraph wire. It's like setting the hook on a two by four. The cutthroat is hooked. He bolts and the rod shatters. <clears throat> there is a drastic glassy crack and the tackle falls slack. I falter back and the line drifts down, rod, tip for, rod tipping forward like a beaver felled sapling into the water. The lower section of the rod is shivered into scores of infinite strips of graphite composite. It looks like Elmer Fudd's shotgun after Bugs Bunny stuck his finger in it. There's no cartoon soot on my face, but I'm as, stud, I'm as stunned as Fudd, eyes blinking. When I regain my senses, I hear laughter. Jason comes up from behind, laughing his big boom booming baritone laugh. It's the end of my first full day in the Wind Rivers. The big sandy valley blazes redly in the fiery sundown. Even, the evening planets and stars burn through the dusk, and all at once the place is a cosmic island of granite, floating, disconnected from the world. Down at the lake, the fish start to rise again, just as my campmates begin breaking sticks of firewood across their, their knees. I head out to fish down by the outlet, where the water is deeper. Hoping to conjure up a big one, I hop out onto a rock and cast long. Sometimes I hook a trout, sometimes the trout gets away, but they hit and hit. They are mindless, elemental, and there is no caution in them. Neither is there desire or sorrow. The fish want only one thing, to live. And so they feed and breed, nothing else. They don't speak, sleep, or dream. Each time I catch one, I'm reminded of how unlike them I am, how complicated and absorbed I am by the absurd abstractions of humankind. Time, ownership, failure, belief. But with each fish I let go, I grow more aware that I am, at least in my cloddish way, among them. There are no cell towers or power lines above us, no pavement or sewer pipes below. All that is between us and the center of the earth is 20 miles of bedrock and a sea of ageless molten iron. And there is nothing but a thin skin of vapor between this lake and the rest of the universe. Thanks. I think I did. <laughs> uh, well, what do you have? What 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 is it about this fly that's uh, special to you? Uh, I just really enjoy tying this this particular hackle is called a soft tackle. It's uh, a wet fly. It doesn't sit on top. It sinks. And the the nature of the, the feather it's, it breathes underwater, and they're fun to tie. They really are. Is that like surgical gauze? What was that? that yes, that is very good. Oh, is it? Oh, I was. Uh, that foam it comes in a three inch wide roll. I cut it with a bread knife. Huh. It's an open cell foam that uh, is used on wounds. Yeah. Right? I, just, yeah. I guess. I thought it was Some of the best fly tying shops in town start with the word Joanne's. <laughs> 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 yeah, you, you find materials where you find them. Well, thanks again, everybody. Um, if you'd like one of these flies, uh, just see Tim. If you'd like to book, let me know. We're going to, I think, move right directly into um, open mic right now. 
So, um, who is going to MC uh, open mic, Sar? You are. I am? Okay, where's the clipboard? It's back there on the uh, It's back there. I can do that. Okay. And you need to entice people to sign up. Yeah, did anybody sign up for open mic yet? Oh, we got some people. Okay, we're going to start. We're going to we're, we're going to go. We're going to go with two people, and then I'll let the the open uh, let the open mic clipboard go around. So we'll start with Mia Jensen and Ronald Jensen. Oh. So Mia and Ronald come up in that order. Clipboard. I'm Mia Jensen. Um, this is a poem adaptation of a dream I had about my lizard, um, with whom I love very much, and who has driven me to Google, are leopard ge geckos capable of love at least every other day? <laughs> <laughs> it's called Water for Clyde. The night sky bleeds through the horizon, transforming the earth to a dark, empty nothing. White shards of frostbitten water pierce the blackness like teeth gnawing at flesh. The snow drips down my spine, warm against my back. Wet beads slither down and out, melting the tension in my neck, arms, legs. The crisp air is cool against my teeth and drifts gently down my throat. It's welcomed by the warm embrace of my lungs. The snow is absorbed by the blaze of my peach round cheeks. It piles higher. The little flakes dance up to my feet, ankles, knees, like ballerinas grazing along the wooden floor. Then I remember, the glistening pool of frozen water doused my consciousness awake to this mistake I made. I forgot to refill my lizard's water dish. My leopard gecko, Clyde, whose life depends on the confines of my memory. Every day my lizard waits for the sound of budging plastic rattling open his cage. Pressing his belly against the glass, he sees the massive figure that is me, the supreme overlord of his universe, granting manna in the form of water and worms. All he must do is have faith I will serve his basic needs for survival. All I must do is secure his loyalty by giving him just enough to leave him wanting more. To leave the impression of my benevolence etched across the instinctual part of his brain. And I forgot. I, the only presence in his world, left his faith and health to wither away like the skin shedding from an overgrown reptile. Maybe it's not too late. Perhaps his cold blood still flows and I can deliver the fluid he needs. The snow, now nuzzling my neck, packs my body beneath its weight. Immobilized, I call for my lizard. Clyde, Clyde, Clyde. The wet air muffles my cry. I try again. Clyde, Clyde, Clyde. Nothing. My eyes moist with tears and snow. The imprisoning pile approaches my nose. I am warm in my frozen cell of snow. Snowflakes light up my hair like pearls strung across the ocean floor. The watery beads sparkle on the black canvas. The silence of flakes finding their kind amongst the frozen earth sings me asleep. My eyes flicker up and down. Clyde, Clyde, Clyde. Just before the snow makes me its corpse, a beam of light erupts from the heavens. Slashing through the sky, it plants feet from my tomb. The snow falls <coughs> beneath the heat, spewing from the light. The blaze leaps across the empty landscape, forcing the snow to retreat into the earth. There, in the middle of the ray, lay Clyde, crumpled in the dampened dirt. Heavy from my melted prison, I lunged my body at the tiny reptile. His once illuminated complexion now dulled with the drought in his veins. His pigment no longer shines ochre and black, but mirrors the dust that lingers within his dehydrated bones. His eyes and mouth crusted over with thick green mucus, sealing any chance of life. His skin brittle in my palms. Flakes of his toes chip from his feet and dissolve to dust in the winter air. My quivering shoulders shake his mangled body. His limbs fall flat on my flesh. <coughs> then he twitches, not for me, but on his own. His mouth peels through the sheet of mucus, exposing his desolate mouth, white, callous, bare. Collecting his strength, he heaves the weight of his head my way. Face to face with the supreme overlord of his universe, he coughs one phrase, I love you, then dies in my hands. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Hi. 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 Hi.
series of adrenal waves with mysterious impacts. One another of the big P waves is peace out of eastward blacks. Two planets are religion or mythology too. Three kinds are holidays, fairy tales, and many as you can do. And four kinds are dictionaries, and the way that we talk. Five kinds are scientists, the cannibals, and the arts. Six kinds are entertainment, and machines of all sorts. Seven kinds are the arts, and calling and sports. Eight kinds are drugs, and poems and plays. Nine kinds are in geography, and history of past days. These are the geographies of people we adore. This is my Dewey poem. I'm going to tell you more. This is coming up from Friday, doing it. From the state's Friday, so I don't know why. This has been given a single piece of pie. They say they don't get it, but they don't understand. They are a will, and they are a man. Until then, before I cut, it was Friday. Give me some pie. Okay, come on up, Ashley McCarty and Hunter Hendricks. Hello. So, I wrote this poem, one, because I love science, and I've been putting science in a lot of what I've been writing lately. And then also is, I'm kind of a very logical person, and I make a lot of my decisions with logic, but not lately. So. They say you don't think too hard, just listen to your gut. But really, there's plenty of communication from the gut to the brain, not just hunger and digestion. We call it the gut-brain axis. The gut has hormones and neurotransmitters in it. It's literally our second brain. But who cares how many brains we have? Some worms have 10 for what seems like no reason. An octopus has a brain in each arm, and those brains fight each other to the point that one arm will rip the other arm off the body. Nine brains, who cares? Ten brains, two brains, or one. It really doesn't matter because sometimes the heart just knows more. So I wrote this poem because I'm fed up with winter. <laughs> <laughs> Snow suffocates me. I await the spring showers that bring forth both daisies and me. <clears throat> when the snow melts and runs into the clouds, then falls again pure, that's when you will return. To brighten days with dark clouds, do you limit without a name known by the masses, unable to voice their desire for you? Your scent of memory, of childhoods, spent running through fields, soft grass between toes, tasting the rain before it arrives. I wait that time again to dance with you, the scent of you glued to my skin in the warm, pouring rain. Is there anyone who wants to sign up? Down to our uh, final three. Do you want to read something to start? Okay, so we'll have next Pam King, who, uh, who accompanied uh, Tim here today. Where did Tim go? I'm back here. Oh, <laughs> okay. And uh, then Mark Smelt, sorry, is that? Yep. Mark. So this is a speech that I'm doing for Toastmasters. Thank you for letting me do it here. When I was a little girl, I had an ant farm. I could watch the ants carry one grain of sand at a time to build their tunnels, to carry out their dead and carry in their food. I could watch them and watch them for hours. If you've ever watched ants, you know that they can carry things that are far bigger than you would think those ant bodies could do. In fact, they can carry 10 to 50 times their weight. 
And they seem to have this solitary goal, and they work towards it, one grain of sand at a time. For decades, I've wanted to join my brother on a backcountry hut trip, to ski up a mountain into a backcountry cabin. I finally said, yes, I'll go. And he explained the hut is at 11,700 feet or so. It's a 1,200 foot elevation climb. Four and a half miles, takes maybe six, seven hours to climb uphill on your skis. Apparently, this is one of the easier huts. But I say, I'm in. I can do this. For much of my professional life, I've wanted to write a book. I wanted to, but I never did. <clears throat> and then I finally did that big scary thing of submitting a proposal to a publisher. And I waited. And I waited. And they accepted. They accepted my book, my proposal. I'm going to write a book. 50,000 words, 10 chapters, 12 months to do it. I'm in. I can do this. Well, it's about time to leave for that hut trip. I'm actually a little bit nervous. I'm not in good shape. I was hoping to work out a little more. But, you know, I am prepared. I have all of my emergency gear. I've got my food and my water and my beverages and my uh, emergency shelter and my avalanche pro. Oh, and the lightest weight toothbrush I could find. <coughs> because apparently, when you're carrying all that in on your back in the fifth hour of skiing, every ounce feels like a pound. But I can do this. I'm prepared. I'm in. Well, I haven't stuck to that goal of writing a little bit every day, not even every week. I'm maybe five months in, and I have not written enough on that book. I've got to focus. I need to focus, and you know, if, if I finish this chapter by the weekend, then oh, I can start maybe the next one Monday or Tuesday, and I'll be okay. I'm okay. I can do this. Oh my gosh. I've been skiing for hours, and the hut is nowhere in sight. I don't think I'm going to make it. I'm wheezing. My feet are killing me. I have so many blisters, I don't even know. I don't think I'm going to make it. I may not make it to the hut. But I can make it to that tree, just that. Well, I have two months left, 60 days. Yeah, I haven't written nearly enough. I'm going to miss the deadline. I'm not going to get the book public, published. I feel like an idiot. I always do this. I put things off, and then I get behind, and I'm in a bind. Great. That's going to make me look stupid. I can't write a book today. I have too many other things that I have to do. I can't write a book today. But I can write one Well, I made that tree, and then another tree, and there's the hut. And yes, you can take my pack. Thank you. I need your help. <coughs> and I can get to the hut one tree at a time. I got that page written, and then another, and then the chapter, and another chapter, and I'm done. Took me 363 days. Yep, two days to spare. That's me. <laughs> I wrote a book one page at a time. Just like ants. If we move one grain of sand at a time, we can do so much. We can take a step. We can go one tree. We can write one page. We can do big things if we'll just Start one grain of sand at a time, just like ants. Yeah. Good excuse.
serrated fishing comb. <laughs> this is just one um, I've been working on in a few different versions. This is Dad's fish. Two silver spinners smack slick black rocks, then slip beneath the model waters of the Logan River. From Dad I stand, downstream, downwind. My lure, meant to imitate trout prey, drags bends of gnat-flecked foam. Instead, it stumbles skittishly by, drifting away from this fertile pool well above Dad's spinner, with its perfect placement deep where the trout always lie. Sunset drops the shadow at my feet. Fish on, I hear over the river's din. The first catch is almost always his. I reel in, drop my hand-me-down rod against the rocks, lean in with my net over the water, pull out Dad's thrashing pale trout. Our first catch of the day, he says, but it's not mine. My line isn't even wet. I tell him I don't want a pity fish. We laugh as he plucks the hook from the trout's bleeding lip and dips it back into the river to disappear. I return to my pole on the rocks. I'd left the line in, in bird's nest knots. Before I can get myself out of that mess, I hear, fish on, again, and reach for my net. Okay, Heidi, uh, Heidi McBurney, I, I think I skipped you, are you here? Okay, we'll go uh, Kayleen and then Heidi will take us out, all right? Kayleen Fox. Kayleen. Oh, sorry, Kayleen. I'm Kayleen. I'm going to read two things. They're both pretty short for kind of um, different moods. The first one is called Dreamish. Well, I wanted a taste of that old wellspring for a thirst too deep to slake, and hunted empty haunts and snowstorm static. And in rushing hillspeak murmurs found myself in feathered fronds, where unhindered mud wasps whispered and washed out my wishing calls. Under attic sweeps where I was weeping, a new growth charted course for destinations writ in fickle futures, and all those potted points retained the rhythm of rain ponds, so when the dam was opened, were rendered drained by dawn. Um, and this one is called Find us in the waves, and I have a question for you to ponder before I read it. And the question is, um, the zombie apocalypse starts right now. Do you, A, grab some guns and take them out, B, hunker down and hope to survive, or C, get out those protein bars you've been hoarding for just this occasion and scatter them around with motivational messages for the people choosing A and B, because that's some hard work, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Find us in the waves. Take a breath, sorry. Find us in the waves, putting an ad out on the radio. To every wandering poet straining at their skin and running hard just to bring to life the burning heat of all those conflicts in their bones, here, we're leaving for the sunrise. Pack your bag and follow the trail of painted rocks and protein bars upon the dock of abandoned cars, keys in the ignition and gas tanks full, post-it notes pasted to the window that read, you got this, good luck, don't let the zombies get you down. Your presence is requested, leave nothing at the door. This, fro this frozen old roof cage won't heat itself and there are tapestries to weave. That vast and barely charted realm of living, le of living left to fill full of hurt and wishes and other strange delights. The zombies don't know much, but they can tell you. Hell is built of emotions left on shelves, but our world won't be. <coughs> Grab your baggage and come on in. We want that forge inside you. as a way to deal with my depression, so we are going to end on a heavy note. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I wrote this piece, um, I've always described my depression as trench warfare, because there's no winning, there's just surviving. So that's what I wrote this piece for. There is a war of attrition going on inside my head, all day, every day. And sometimes I wonder why my whole body has not disintegrated from trench rock yet. How has my skin not sloughed off my bones from the years spent drenched in doubt and self-loathing? How has the constant barrage of criticism and hate not blown me to bits to be scattered by the wind? I blast holes in my own defenses, pepper my own heart with a spray of bullets because feeling isn't worth a damn. Wait. Yes, it is. 
and fuck, it hurts, and it's coming out now, too fast, too intense. But the absence of pain isn't peace, it's death. Sometimes it's quiet up here in my head. The guns stop firing and the grenades become distant thunder. The parts of me that are dying finally stop screaming. And light breaks through the cloud cover, bathing the battlefield in dust motes and soft, fragile hope. For a few moments, it is quiet, and the smile on my face isn't hiding blood anymore. Thank you for everyone. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, for reading and for being here and uh, for joining us. Uh, maybe just one more uh, uh, hand for our hero Tim. Um, so there, our next uh, our next Pelican West is the twenty first, and it's the Bullpen Slam. Bullpen pen Slam with Shannon Wright. Oh. <laughs> they have to choose you, too. I'll be here. I don't know if I'm coaching this year, though. Oh, okay. All right. But it is the bullpen slam, and it's always a good time. It's always a group of, uh, a great group. Um, as you go, please uh, pick up a chair or two and stack your chairs on that uh, far wall there. Uh, and, uh, yeah, thanks again for coming. And buy a book. <laughs>